Welcome to Deluxe. We take a look at the brands that exude luxury and style. From the cars built for kings, through prestige architecture and makeup, to the star who doesn't fade, we visit brands at the top of everyone's must have list. One successful branding strategy is to name your business after yourself. In the 21st century, the name of Christian Dior is synonymous with prestige and luxury design. And he began his house of fashion in a dramatic way. Nobody really knew the impact his first collection was going to have. But it was clear from the moment the first model stepped onto the catwalk that this was a quite different collection. He brought together many of the elements that had been in the air. For example, there had been a tendency towards longer, fuller skirts in, um, towards the end of the war. But what Dior did was he brought all these different elements together, the sloping shoulders, the cinched in waist, the long, full skirts. So Dior really caught the mood of the moment, and his clothes are very romantic, and they presented a, a great alternative to the military wartime fashions. A recent exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London celebrated fashion in the decade from 1947, a period that Christian himself called the Golden Age. Fashion during the war years had been unadorned and cut close to the body in order to save on cloth. Christian's feminine designs were greeted with great relief by fashion-conscious women across Europe, and his new look began a rash of imitators. Balenciaga and Givenchy also had some early designs in the exhibition, and both of these fashion houses have also become major brands. Christian launched a perfume, Miss Dior, which was named after his sister, Catherine. Now it is standard for fashion houses to brand across many related areas. Christian also released hosiery, furs, handbags, hats, gloves and jewellery. Dior is now headed by the uber-talented John Galliano, and some of his modern designs could also be glimpsed in the show. In 2007, the House of Dior kicked off the famous Paris Haute Couture shows with a stunning show at Versailles in celebration of its 60th anniversary. Hollywood stars and celebrities crowded into the 300-year-old orangery at the palace, which was built by France's Sun King, Louis XIV. Some of the most famous supermodels, including Naomi Campbell and Linda Evangelista, returned to the stage to model John Galliano's inspirations. John stated that this show was a tribute to painters, from Leonardo da Vinci to Pablo Picasso. Spanish film director Pedro Almodovar found much to admire in John's show. For me, it's a, it's a big inspiration. I'm a big fan of the house, of, of La Maison, and also of Galliano. Galliano, I think, is just this example of fashion designer, which is something else. I mean, he's a real artist. In 2008, John once again took the brand of Dior and revitalized it, adding studs, staples, chain mail, and python leather to toughen up his floating summer dresses. The celebrities again lined the catwalk, this time in the Jardin de Tuileries in Paris. John has headed Dior for 10 years, and he continues to find ways to incorporate Dior's unique beginnings into his avant-garde designs. Um, well, I really liked the first, the first few looks. I love the classic Dior suit, hourglass shapes. Those are kind of the things that I always look to add to my wardrobe because I love, I love wearing suits. Swiss luxury watch brand Tag Heuer are very aware that working with a star can bring tremendous cachet to a brand. Uma Thurman has a unique blend of beauty and strong physical presence that clearly appeals to the watch designer. In 2005, Uma was in Paris at the stunning Four Seasons George V Hotel to launch the new collection of Tag Heuer watches, including the Mini Link River of Diamonds, inspired by the actress herself. I think that time is um, one of the, is the most precious commodity in the world, and certainly it is to me. Every moment, uh, if I ever feel I'm wasting a moment, I, it's kind of become painful for me. Um, time with my family, time with my, my parents, my mother, my children, 
time with what I love to do creatively, time experiencing the world and meeting people. It's just, it's, it's all so precious. The exclusive watch is designed to represent Uma in that it's both sporty and elegant. Made with polished stainless steel, the mother of pearl face is adorned with around 70 diamonds. Many prestige brands involve themselves in charity work. Tag Heuer's brand connection has traditionally been to sport. But in 2006, the watchmaker diversified into the arts when it brought together a unique collection of photographs to raise money for the United Nations Development Fund for Women. Uma Thurman was the Tag Heuer ambassador and she introduced the unique collection of work titled Strength and Beauty. For a luxury brand like Tag to put itself um, in full support of I think probably one of the most important women's organizations, UNIFEM, to bring 30 women from 15 countries together to create works of art to benefit women around the world shows that they have a true commitment to not just being a men's company, to being a, a company that respects the strength and effort and rights of women. All the women in the portraits and the female photographers donated their time and skills to the project. The Queen of Burlesque, Dita Von Tees, performed later in the evening. Strength and beauty is a winning combination together. If you throw in a little glamour and then you know, you've got a winning combination. Your charm and glamour, strength and beauty, that's what everyone should aspire to do. The photographs themselves were set to travel the world before being auctioned off. All proceeds would go to UNIFEM in their global mission of promoting women's rights and gender equality. Formula One driver David Coulthard has also been the face of Tag Heuer, his prestige and skill lending kudos to the brand in a relationship that benefits both. Here, David is just off the track after a win in the Monaco Grand Prix in 2002. And he's in New York on his way through to the Canadian Grand Prix. While in the city, he unveiled a four-storey Tag Heuer billboard. David is the lead driver for the McLaren Mercedes F1 team. And the Swiss watchmaker is the official timekeeper of Formula One, a position which emphasises its brand signature of extraordinary accuracy. Coming up, a world-famous architect and prestige toys for the boys. Zaha Hadid is arguably the most famous female architect alive, and she has turned her stunning design work into a brand which all the top companies are keen to attach to their name. At an exhibition in London's Design Museum recently, the sheer scope and magnitude of her work was clear. She's been working about trying to redefine what architecture can be for the last 30 years. She's always had this idea about exploding space, about making buildings look like nothing else has happened before. And now she's got a chance to build those things all around the world. She's working in China, in Russia, in the Middle East, uh, Japan, America. And she has the kind of touch of, I think, right now, making extraordinarily beautiful buildings that look completely fresh and all of her own. Zaha was born in Iraq and she studied mathematics in Beirut before coming to the UK in 1972 to study architecture. She found London in the 1970s an incredibly interesting place to study and then work as the rapidly expanding city changed its face. Zaha places a lot of emphasis on fluidity in her buildings and she works hard to balance functionality with a bold and dynamic aesthetic. One of her more famous pieces is the BMW building in Leipzig. Combining her brand with the well-known German car manufacturer provided a unique opportunity to create something memorable. In this case, a building where the different needs of white and blue collar workers come together in the one space. We decided to look at the idea of landscape in the interior of the, of the BMW. So it's like a series of terracing. So there was the vision but it's not divided by walls, but by space. So I think it's interesting in how the light comes in from the sides and you have a kind of a daily lit building, uh, but it's not one single trading floor. 
Zaha has also worked on major international museums, including the Rosenthal Center for Contemporary Art, and she won the competition to design the Maxi National Museum of 20th Century Art in Rome. She's also expanded her brand out into furniture design, where she can continue to explore ideas around fluidity and tactility. Future projects include the new Abu Dhabi Arts Centre and the new London Aquatic Centre for the 2012 Olympics. Each building is designed to work in its own particular location. I think it always inspires you to come up with something which is interesting in that location. So, you know, if you are operating with a very, maybe very tight side, you have to go vertically. You can maybe as you go further up become much fluid or the interiors become fluid. Uh, I don't think it's, you know, we are not embedded to the idea of only curvature, but the idea of, of fluidity also implies a degree of seamlessness and also the boundary between the indoor and the outdoor, the interior space, exterior, and also it implies fluidity, sort of people movement, that you can move through space very easily, very fluidly and accessible in a way. In 2004, the luxury car manufacturer Rolls-Royce celebrated their 100-year anniversary. The Rolls is one of the most recognizable luxury car brands in the world, and the ownership of a Rolls is considered almost obligatory for the seriously rich. From the earliest days, Rolls-Royce was a brand committed to cutting-edge design and engineering. Charles Stuart Rolls and Henry Royce determined to provide British vehicles and engines for use on land, water or in the air. True to their pioneering spirits, Rolls-Royce now produce world-class engines across civil and military aviation, for helicopters, commercial shipping and, of course, for their much sought-after cars. At the 74th Geneva International Motor Show in 2004, Rolls-Royce unveiled the amazing 100EX, a one-off luxury open-top four-seater. The car is the first centenary experimental design to be produced by Rolls since BMW took custody of the brand in 1998. This unique vehicle is not intended to be manufactured, but is rather a showcase for the brand. In terms of uh... Our investment in the engineering of the car, this is really a tour de force, everything from its uh, amazing body shell, this amazing engine you're going to see in, in a second. Um, these are all the ideas that we have for the future, so we're starting to lay the foundations for the next century for Rolls-Royce, and uh, we're very, very proud of it. Here, the Duke of York visits the Rolls-Royce manufacturing plant in southern England, where the world's top-selling super luxury car, the Rolls-Royce Phantom, is manufactured. Each of the bespoke cars takes around 360 man-hours to build and costs hundreds of thousands of pounds. Still, demand for the prestige vehicle continues to be strong. Around 90% of what we produce here at Goodwood is exported, so uh, primarily to the major markets around the world, the United States being the number one. But uh, of late, we've also seen a lot of expansion into Asia, China, uh, Japan, and uh, many of the countries which you would uh, expect to see the cars like the Middle East. The Rolls-Royce Phantom with extended wheelbase is the second car to be built in this newly opened plant and it was followed in 2007 by a new convertible model. Another prestige brand in the transport world is Harley-Davidson. The American motorcycle manufacturer recently opened its first store in Beijing and those with money, and those who can only dream, came out to admire the powerful metallic machines. I like Harley-Davidson very much. If I can afford it one day, I will definitely buy one of the Harleys. Harley-Davidson motorcycles have been manufactured since 1903, and the Wisconsin-based brand is best known for its classic design and the particular deep note of the exhaust. Harley's customer base is very loyal, and the king of motorbikes is celebrated as the finest heavyweight motorcycle on the road. In China, there are a number of restrictions on motorcycles, restrictions which haven't stopped motorcycle enthusiasts from joining clubs and saving their pennies for a big Harley. Harley has also expanded into Russia with a new store in central Moscow. 
which rich Russians can spend anything up to $50,000 buying a piece of the American dream. Motorcycle enthusiasts are thrilled that the big bike has finally returned to Russia. The original dealership opened in 1913 in St. Petersburg, but closed soon after the Bolshevik Revolution. We have many enthusiasts today in Russia that ride Harley Davidson. So we know we have some bikers who love the brand and they found a way of bringing a motorcycle into Moscow or into Russia. What we are hoping to see is that a much more diverse group of people from the middle classes, from the professions, the wealthy, that will be attracted by both the motorcycle and the brand experience. Our experience everywhere else in the world is that we sell to a very diverse group of people. People who love motorcycling or people who've come to Harley Davidson because of the experience that we offer. And we expect to see a similar thing happening in Moscow. In 2002, Dubai played host to the Middle East's third Harley Davidson rally, and motorcycle aficionados were treated to long and pristine roads that typify the wealthy city. It's not just the road, but also the weather that draws these fans. While Europe is gripped by frost and rain, Dubai offers the kind of weather that makes motorcycling a pleasure. At bike prices starting at $15,000, most riders are well-heeled businessmen who love the chance to take off the suit and feel the freedom of the open road. And after a day of hard riding, evenings were spent relaxing in a luxury seaside resort and admiring each other's often customised bikes. Coming up, exclusive beauty and the actress who became a fashion brand. French cosmetic giant L'Oreal enhances the prestige of its powerful brand by making an important contribution to the health and welfare of women. This function at the American Museum of Natural History brought together Hollywood stars, music legends, philanthropists and medical researchers to highlight important work being done in ovarian cancer. I've been a, a part of the L'Oreal family for six years now, going on seven years, and it's more than just makeup. It's, it's about empowerment, and um, I'm so happy to be a part of this night with L'Oreal. They've raised over $13 million to raise awareness of ovarian cancer, so this is an important night, a beautiful night. L'Oreal has raised money through the sale of their Color of Hope bracelet, as well as through a special line of cosmetics. L'Oreal spokeswomen include high-profile celebrities Eva Longoria, Diane Keaton, Fran Drescher and Andy McDowell. Another way beauty brands such as L'Oreal keep themselves current is to be centre stage at all the top events on the celebrity calendar. In this way, their products can be identified with the most beautiful and wealthiest women in the world. The Golden Globe Awards provide a rich opportunity to show the public new makeup directions and tastes and to get their products into the hands of taste setters. Oh, of course we have Beyonce, who's amazing, and if you saw Dreamgirls, it's like, uh, incredible. Um, and of course, Scarlett Johansson, but um, Beyonce is nominated, as well as Penelope Cruz, and they'll get these beautiful things. The L'Oreal Paris 2007 Red Carpet Compact was gifted to all female Golden Globe nominees in all categories. The original compact, designed by Quait Diamonds, was auctioned for charity. The Academy Awards is the prime event that prestige makeup brands must make an appearance at. Renowned makeup artists provide guests with tips and techniques, and women worldwide watch the red carpet for new looks to incorporate into their own lives. What I wanted to do with Alison is give her um, an interpretation of what we saw in the spring runways, you know, a very flushed cheek and a bright lip, and I'm not going to use red, I'm going to actually use more of a fuchsia color just to mix it up a bit. And what I've done here is I wanted her eyes to look natural yet dramatic at the same time, so I just played them up with, uh, with earth tones so that you get this natural quality to it, yet there's still an element of drama. In the highly competitive fashion world, Prada stands out as a brand which signifies opulence and quality. And to own a Prada accessory or haute couture piece is a status symbol of the highest order. The Italian company was originally a leather goods shop, which first opened in 1913. 
But when Miucha Prada, the granddaughter of the founder, took over the label in 1978, she turned Prada into a world-class luxury brand. In this 2005 spring-summer collection, Miucha again proved why her design work is at the forefront of contemporary fashion. When she bucked the dominant pink and blue trend to present an autumnal palette, Miucha herself stated that the collection was just about things she wanted to do, rather than having any particular kind of inspiration. A lot of attention was once again on her shoes and handbags, which generate a substantial profit worldwide for the brand, and immediately spawn countless cheap imitations. In this winter collection for 2007, Miucha reflected a growing macho mood in women's wear. Previously, Prada fashion was known for its stripped back and minimalist quality, but here, bold fashion statements such as vinyl, feathers, and a fluffy teddy bear coat show that Miucha is always ready to reinvent the brand. Some of the ideas for this unusual collection were obvious in the men's collection, which had been launched one month earlier. The cross-pollination of ideas suggests Prada may consider presenting the two collections together in the future. Highlights of Miusha's non-conformist look include high-heeled platform sandals worn with toeless knee socks, and this time the famous Prada handbag was without handles. Sarah Jessica Parker, actress and film star, is one of the few contemporary American actresses who is truly an international brand. Here, Sarah has been asked to host the Council of Fashion Designers of America Fashion Awards, which are the Academy Awards for fashion. The stars are out in style, but Sarah wins hands down, primarily because of her association with the fashionista and wildly popular TV show, Sex and the City. Although Sarah has done much previous acting work and began her distinguished stage and screen career as a teenager, it was her role as Carrie Bradshaw, a New York columnist with cutting-edge fashion tastes, that was responsible for her becoming a household name. Women the world over who juggled work and relationships and who loved fashion and shoes fell in love with the four Sex and the City girls who shopped and romanced in New York City. An ecstatic German audience showed how much it was appreciated when the TV series became a film. As per usual, Sarah was dressed in something fitting an international star, one who is closely watched and copied by many women. The stunning dress she wore is by Versace, who made it especially for the opening. Sarah has been able to expand her brand and use her role as fashion icon to work with fashion labels and Garnier, a cosmetic company. Sarah also has launched a number of perfumes. Her first, Lovely, was a big hit, and its success encouraged her to design another, this time calling it Covet. Sarah chose to launch Covet in Paris, the city of love and fashion, and she arrived at the famous Champs-Élysées looking her usual glamorous self where hundreds of exuberant fans were waiting for a glimpse of the diminutive star. Sarah knows, just as much as any large international brand, that staying in the eye and hearts of the public is the major battle. With these prestige brands, you know you get something that little bit more special.